Good afternoon and uh, welcome to our workshop Breaking Bias, Navigating Workplace Discrimination with AI. In the next uh, one and a half hours, we will delve into complex interplay between natural human biases and how AI can either reduce or worsen workplace discrimination. Uh, my name is uh, Petra Perklova. I work in the European Commission, uh, DG Employment, uh, Social Affairs and Inclusion in a unit dealing with future of work. And before I introduce our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, let's go straight to the audience. And I would like to warmly welcome um, everyone to the, one of the last workshops of this uh, two-day marathon uh, featuring uh, very interesting sessions. And um, uh, as you know, this uh, year, the, um, the topic of the European Economic and Social Forum was uh, focused on the impact of uh, AI on the world of work. And let's go straight to, to, to the audience. And I would like to um, ask a simple question. So if we can please uh, put on the, the Slido. And, uh, and the first question, uh, maybe we start with the question rather than uh, with the answer. Um, so, um, indeed, I would like to inquire uh, our audience in the room, but also our online participants, um, with a simple question. How much information do you think that we process unconsciously? And uh, we have some options for you on the Slido, so please, uh, uh, you can use the hashtag mentioned on the screen uh, or, or scan this QR code and uh, please let us know as quickly as you can. And uh, you can also use the same tool, uh, Slido, to ask any questions uh, to our panelists and they will answer them later on uh, during our workshop. And you can also specify for whom you, you want to pose the questions, if you wish. Um, and now, please uh, let me um, briefly introduce our session. Um, so, workplace discrimination is nothing new. Uh, AI was initially seen as an opportunity to address inequalities between, um, uh, faced by women, ethnic minorities, older or younger workers. The hope was indeed that AI would broaden the talent pool and ensure that hiring and management decisions are based solely on competencies. And indeed, AI can formalize rules, bring in certain objectivity to rec recruitment and people management. However, it also brings its own challenges. Um, and uh, very often, instead of eliminating bias in organizations, it can actually reinforce it. An example is, is the Amazon Cane, which is uh, quite uh, known, which used AI recruitment software to hire software developers. However, it appeared that the software discriminated against women because historically the programmers were predominantly men. Uh, moreover, AI tools can discriminate against specific groups such as persons uh, with disabilities. Um, and AI as a computer program is not inherently biased, but as we've heard yesterday by Professor Russell, biases arise from the training data or they may uh, result from choices made by human programmers. Um, in the EU, we have the anti-discrimination anti law, we have also the upcoming Artificial Intelligence Act and other initiatives. But is it enough or do we need more legislation or policy to tackle biases and discrimination at the workplace? So in today's workshop, we will address three sets of questions. First, we will examine the sources of bias and discrimination associated with AI tools and explore whether um, system providers and employers can mitigate such risks. Next, we will look at how AI can be leveraged to promote uh, diversity and inclusion at the workplace. And lastly, we will conclude by looking at the current regulatory and policy framework regarding bias and discrimination and try to answer indeed whether more is still needed. So now let's embark on this journey on how to shape a fair and inclusive future. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished uh, panel members and I would like to warmly thank to all of you for accepting our invitation. It's, it's really great to have you here. So uh, let me start with uh, Virginia Dignum. Uh, Virginia is a professor of responsible AI at uh, Umea University 
and senior advisor to the Wallenberg Foundation. She is affi affiliated with prestigious organizations like the Royal Swedish Academy or of Engineering Sciences and the European AI Association. She serves on the UN Advisory Body, the Global Partnership and the UNESCO's and OECD's Expert Group. As the founder of ALI, the Dutch AI Alliance, and co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on AI, Virginia actively shapes AI practices. Um, and she was also a member of the high-level expert group on artificial intelligence and an author of a book, Responsible Artificial Intelligence. Virginia, a few weeks ago, you became a member of a prestigious UN uh, advisory body on artificial intelligence focusing on global governments. Our commissioner mentioned it a few times yesterday. Uh, what are your plans in this new role? Uh, yes, uh, the, the, this uh, um, United Nations advisory body on AI was called by the uh, United Nations General Secretary to advise the United Nations about what, uh, whether and what should uh, global governance for AI look like. Do we need some new agency which looks at AI like we are doing, for instance, with IPCC for climate or with the AIEA for uh, atomic energy. Uh, so how should that be done? Uh, how, uh, what, what is needed and how can such a global uh, governance body address issues both of uh, the opportunities and the enablers of AI and at the same time the risks and challenges that come with AI. We are working at the extremely uh, uh, high speed. Uh, the group was uh, initiated one month ago. We have literally almost every day meetings and we are supposed to uh, deliver a draft of our initial ideas already uh, before the Christmas. Indeed, so it's, uh, it's going to be a very fast pace. I yes. can imagine you yeah. spent uh, most of your time in New York now. and <laughs> Not really. We fortunately do most of it uh, online. Okay. So all the meetings uh, so far have been uh, uh, virtual. We will have a couple of meetings, so one now before Christmas, but in the continuous of the work after the, after the new year, we'll have a couple of uh, live meetings. But fortunately for the 38 of us that are members of this group, we can mostly work Indeed. from our own so place. Good luck with this. Uh, with this hard work now. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, let's go to uh, Maureen uh, Pigot, uh, our second uh, panelist. And uh, Maureen is a member of the European Disability Forum's Executive Committee. Uh, she is also a former president of Inclusion Europe, the Association of People with Intellectual Disability. And uh, she is an advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities, for which she received an honor from Queen Elizabeth. Uh, with a background in education and social services, she served also as a director of Mencamp in Northern Ireland for over two decades. And she participated as an expert uh, to projects involving AI, such as the Tide and Telematic projects of the European Union. And currently, her pivotal role in the EDF's executive committee indeed focuses on AI projects in the disability sector. Uh, so, Maureen, as AI has certainly become a, a buzzword recently, um, when did you first encounter AI and, and recognize its potential to actually help people with disabilities? Well, as you said in, in my short life story, I've spent a lot of my life working with and being personally involved with people with intellectual disability. So, as a teacher in special education, I saw the potential of computer-assisted learning and also games for helping people to learn. And the more I learned about computing, the more I began to think about the ways it might help. When you add AI into the mix, it becomes very exciting. For the first time, we have a technology that could be for people with intellectual and other cognitive impairments, what the wheelchair has been for people with mobility impairments. That's a very exciting idea if we can make it happen. So when that idea met the funding opportunity of the TIDE project, TIDE pilot program, which was um, what would now be in the Horizon um, R&D programs, TIDE stood for Technology for the Integration of Disabled and Elderly People, a very exciting pilot program. And I led a project that was to test the ideas of how we could use AI to help people with daily living tasks. 
So with the help of software engineers, electronic engineers, a multidisciplinary team of psychologists, occupational therapists, and willing volunteers in two adult centers in Ireland, North and South, we built an integrated system that used sensor technology, um, monitoring technology, and a prompting strategy to help people to learn to cook. We learned from it a number of things. First of all, we learned that the technology was not yet smart enough, nor reliable enough. And we also learned that we hadn't given the users enough of a say in the design. And I think those are still the challenges we're facing today. Okay, thank you. So it's really about the positive side of AI and how can we actually use to improve our lives. And as you say, uh, AI is not that intelligent yet as we might think. So indeed, uh, we are still uh, looking for the new developments. Um, and now, uh, Elin uh, Martenson, our, our ne next uh, distinguished speaker, is the CEO of uh, Tengai Unbiased, a Stockholm-based uh, HR tech uh, startup. She is a tech leader and recruitment pioneer with over 15 years of experience in HR strategies and IT recruitment. And she was recognized as a global TA tech top influencer as she has served in director roles uh, at global recruitment players as well as at startups. Uh, she is renowned for introducing an AI interview robot. I am sure we will hear about that today. Um, designed to mitigate unconscious bias in recruitment. And beyond tech, uh, tech innovation, she also champions workplace diversity, urging global organizations to embrace AI-powered solutions for fairer hiring. Elin, uh, could you please share us, with us a story how you became the CEO of a company specializing in bias-free recruitment software? What, what inspired your journey to this field? Well, thank you for having me here. It's an honor being sitting here to, together with these uh, fantastic people here. But I just to give you some background, I'm, uh, about 20 years ago when I graduated high school or college, um, I was out applying for jobs. Um, I had a master in marketing and I applied for approximately 100 jobs. Um, and it was tough and it was frustrating and I saw all the challenges in sort of getting through the noise uh, of applying for jobs. And then one thing happened. Uh, I applied for a job that I really wanted, that I had the exact education for. I thought that I had the exact skill sets for this job. And then all of a sudden, I heard from a colleague classmate that said that, and he said that he'd applied for the same job. Uh, same age as me, but he was a male. And he got the job, and I didn't even get an interview. And that was frustrating. I was angry. So I made it my lifetime mission to fight bias within recruitment. So I started working for a recruitment agency 20 years ago, and I haven't, start, I haven't stopped since. This is my lifetime passion to make sure that we can create a process, a situation, and a structured method in order to, to reduce and mitigate bias throughout a recruitment process. And as you probably are aware, there is a lot of discrimination around the work field uh, overall, but if we can mitigate those unconscious biases, uh, we can come a, a much further way in selecting the right candidates for the roles that we're recruiting for. So uh, just fast forwarding 20 years up until now, five years ago, I started a company called Tengai, and we uh, launched a physical robot on the, on the recruitment market in order to mitigate bias uh, from collecting data in the interview, uh, interview situation. Uh, but for probably, uh, I think it's 13 years ago now, I started working for a recruitment agency that has their focus in unbiased recruitment methodology. So I was the chief innovation officer there. And uh, um, from that position, we fought like um, different methods and uh, processes in order to structure up uh, the recruitment process, making it more objective and so that our recruiters could make more informed and objective hiring decisions. So this was actually a result from that work. Um, we took the process, turning it inside out and, and upside down in order to 
uh, sort of uh, looking into the bits and pieces of what makes a good hiring decision. And we found out that all of the recruiters that we had, including myself, was totally biased. And um, we, um, we um, started working with unbiased training. We started working with methodologies and so on in the sort of in the fundamental process in order to mitigate bias. But we also saw that that wasn't enough. People were still biased when it uh, comes to looking into um, uh, gender or ethnicity or age uh, or beauty or, <laughs> or looks. Um, so uh, we saw that we needed to use technology as a, um, another layer uh, of the recruitment process to help us uh, make more informed decisions. So uh, Tenga is a result of all of that work with a fundamental process and the changes in the process. So the new, uh, the new technology that we have launched on the market uh, just recently is a digital version of this physical robot. We collected all the data so that we know that we can collect accurate data. Uh, so Tengai is now um, handling um, um, processes for our clients, uh, helping them to include more candidates in the beginning of a recruitment process so that everyone can have a say uh, in the recruitment process, including all candidates in high volume processes, asking questions from conversational AI uh, in a structured way and collecting that data from those conversations in an objective and structured way and presenting that data to a recruiter that can make an informed decision together with a hiring manager. It's just so, looking up on yeah. the data, nothing else, and not being influenced by other stuff such as age or gender or looks or ethnicity or disabilities, or whatever. It's uh, super interesting because indeed it all in starts with this unconscious bias that we probably all have. And this actually leads us to the, to the results of our poll. And if we can uh, display uh, please uh, the uh, the figures uh, so how much information do you think that we process unconsciously majority of people think 79 percent but actually the research says that uh, human brain receives 11 million bits of information every moment but we can only process 40 of them which leaves 99 percent of information is processed unconsciously so indeed, inevitably, we are all unconsciously biased. But how do AI systems are now dealing with these biases? Um, before we go to our um, discussion, or indeed on, on the bias, maybe we can still launch the second question, and then you will still have a little bit of time throughout the session. And we can uh, indeed, and if you can, uh, if you can let us know whether you think that the current AI systems promote more or less diversity at the workplace. And you have a choice from much more diversity, slightly more, no change really, to slightly less and much less diversity. And we will come back to it in a moment. Uh, so indeed, now we are in the first uh, part of our, our serious uh, discussion about the sources of bias and, and discrimination and uh, what the system providers and employers can do to mitigate them. Uh, so Virginia, to start with you, um, based on your re research, what are the main sources of bias uh, that arise from the use of AI at the workplace? And what are the primary ethical and moral issues uh, that are related to that? And is it at all possible to develop systems which are bias-free and fair? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let's we also up on that. Well, let's, let's be controversial this uh, Friday afternoon. So. Uh, we don't want bias-free systems. We are not bias-free, like the, uh, the, the pool just showed. We need bias to survive. If we don't have bias, we are not able to select which are the 40 decisions that we can take at every second. So we, in a sense, bias is not the, the bad thing here. What is the bad thing is take, make judgments based on preconceived notions or prejudices. That is one part of the bias. Bias, but in principle, bias in itself is not the problem here. We need bias, we need to make selections. We can only have so much time to do these selections. So, in a, uh, like I say, it's about the prejudice, it's about the decisions that we take based on uh, 
past uh, notions or preconceived notions which then lead to discrimination. And that is what we need to address and that is what it's important to, to make sure. AI, like uh, uh, what, what mo the most, uh, probably the most um, relevant uh, role of AI in all this is that AI is able to show to us a mirror of what we are doing. And not only a mirror, but an enlarging mirror. What we see in these examples that you give is that AI replicates those prejudices that we have taken in the past and make them bigger, so in a way that we cannot really ignore them anymore. So in that sense, we can even uh, by uh, even these systems that are bias or prejudiced can help us understand and uh, mitigate and deal with the, the, the prejudices that we have. But uh, the sources of bias are not just, we, when we talk about bias, we usually think right away about data, that the data that we have collected is wrong and it was based on uh, old decisions, people that didn't really understood or they had uh, all kinds of uh, pre uh, prejudices themselves and all that data is what leads to the bias. That is for, for sure a large part of it, but there is also many more uh, technical or AI specific uh, aspects which lead to bias, starting by the decision which is the data that we are going to use, how are we going to use this data, what kind of uh, process are we taking to not only uh, collect the data but also measure it, and if we want to go even more technical, AI systems act uh, cannot exist without uh, acting or uh, developing some bias. For instance, uh, I don't know how much you, want, you know about how a machine learning algorithm works, but basically imagine a large piece of paper in which each piece of the data is a dot on this piece of paper. What a, an AI algorithm wants to do is to identify where the next dot should go in this large piece of paper. We do that by many different types of functions and the selection of this function will uh, inform the way that we determine what is this next dot in the uh, in the paper but one of the most common of these fo functions is what we call a linear regression which is making trying to make one line one straight line who goes through as many points as possible that are there in the data. You can see already that how far your dots are from this line how more prejudice they will be in terms of the final decision. In terms of classification systems, so deciding whether this is a cat or a dog, this is uh, um, uh, someone who should get the job or should not get the job, these functions work with thresholds. So there is a certain threshold of the features that we have identified that decides, okay, above this threshold is a cat, uh, below this threshold is a dog, above this threshold you get a job, below this threshold you don't get a job. These thresholds are, again, very, very bi can be very biased. For instance, if it's about deciding someone is tall or short, we put the threshold at, let's say, one, uh, one meter 80. Does that mean that someone which is one meter 79.9999 is short? Yes, for the, uh, for the AI system, that would be a short person because we put the line there. So all this type of technical aspects on the, the, the functions and the systems that we develop can increase or decrease the bias. But in a sense, what we need is to understand how this works and how this combined with the necessarily biased uh, data that we have, how this, how this works. So it's much more about understanding how it works, understanding the, the mirror that it is giving us in terms of the, the decisions that we have taken in the past, where we need to look, uh, to look for instead of trying to develop the hypothetical bias-free uh, system. So it does not exist, uh, you convinced no. us. Um, and also, I think it's very interesting what you said, that I mean, the biases are actually helping us in, in the decision, yeah. make, uh, making our life easier. And AI can indeed be this mirror that shows us actually what the reality is. But what is the bad thing is indeed the discrimination that comes out yes. of it. And yeah. this is what needs, needs yeah. to be fo um, we need to fight. Um, Ma Maureen, now, uh, now back to you. Um, what are the most common instances of biases at the workplace that affect the life and, and working conditions of people with disabilities? Um, in, in your view, have these biases been impacted by AI uh, at the workplace? 
And if so, how? Well, we start with just following on from the discussion on bias and prejudice. We've, we've learned that bias is endemic. In fact, it's part of how our brains work. And sadly, so is prejudice um, endemic. Yeah. Um, Chris Goody, who is a person who studies the history of culture, psychology, education, and is also the father of a, a woman with Down syndrome, has a term for it. He says, we suffer from social exclusion disorder. And AI can turn that disorder into a pandemic. And that's what we have to try to fight. In the workplace, the first place where, where bias comes into it is in the admission to the workforce in the first place, which we've talked about, and I really look forward to hearing more about Eleni's um, systems. Um, it's at that point, when a person is a job seeker, that we see the bias coming into operation, where assumptions are made about what the person can and can't do, and their suitability or eligibility for the job. And that shows in the statistics. People with disabilities are half as likely to be in employment as the rest of the population. In fact, less than half as likely. And if you look at different groups of people with disabilities, it's even worse. For people with intellectual disability or autism, it's 10% or under 10% are in paid open employment. And for women, the figures are worse. So if you're a woman and you have a disability, it's even worse. Now this is not only a problem for the disabled person, it's actually a problem for the employers. Because they have a missed opportunity to get the diversity, the unique perspectives and the skills of disabled people into their workforce. So some hiring um, technologies try to predict who will be a good employee. And they do that by comparing applicants to successful employees already in the business. But as we've heard, people with disabilities have been excluded from the workforce. And so people there are not sufficient people in that organization um, who have been successful with a disability to inform the hiring decision. So there are gaps in the data and in the knowledge base of the organization. It hasn't had the, it, the organization and the AI have not got the information to act on to see how they can best include people with disability. And this may in fact result in discrimination, which is illegal in terms of the EU employment law. Machine learning is good at dealing with cases that are similar to the data on which it was trained. Not so good when people deviate from the statistical average. And in statistical terms, a disability is essentially a deviation from the average. And furthermore, People with disabilities differ from each other more than other people differ from each other. So when choosing technologies, employers have to be particularly careful in considering how the system deals with different disabilities. And if you consider that there are 85 million people with disabilities in Europe, that's one in five of us, and that all of us at some stage in our lives will have experienced an impairment either temporarily or permanently. So having experience in disability is a competitive advantage for businesses. So other ways in which technology can exclude people. If we look at how job adverts are targeted in the first place, who knows that there's a job vacancy and what's required for it? Those adverts are targeted in ways that, that don't reach people with disabilities. When employers decide whether or not um, a, a candidate meets the job qualifications, um, they have an obligation to provide a reasonable adjustment so that a candidate with a disability can show how they meet the standards for that job. Not all AI systems allow for that or offer mm -hmm. a disabled applicant the opportunity to request that reasonable accommodation. Video interviews are a common hiring technique. 
and sometimes video interviews uh, use AI and facial recognition or the recognition of facial expressions as part of the assessment of a candidate. Does that take account of the differences in facial characteristics, eye contact of candidates who might be blind, might have autism, might have cerebral palsy, Down syndrome? I would suggest that they haven't taken account of all of the diversity of characteristics um, of the whole population, but especially of people with disabilities. And AI can also have a part in other employment-related um, systems, like surveillance and performance management. So similarly, that same diversity of characteristics has to be factored into how those systems operate. So the key to it is to be clear about the objectives of the system. What are we trying to achieve? If an employer sets out to make sure that their employment AI helps to deliver a quality workforce and a workforce that promotes equality and not just to save money by speeding things up, um, then I think we would realize that we can't always use AI to make the decisions. Um, human judgment, human thinking needs to come into it, having a person in the loop. But also in the design of the system in the first place. So in summary, design for inclusion in the first place. Co-design with people with disabilities and evaluate systems before using them. And as good practice, not only in using AI, but any hiring practice or, or job uh, management systems, use anti-discrimination monitoring to make sure you're getting the outcomes that you should. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it was uh, very interesting, and I think you pointed indeed to the thing that AI is actually good at things when we are do, do dealing with average, but when it comes to something which is a little bit specific, or then, then AI actually has a lot of shortcomings. And maybe now it's actually a very good uh, opportunity that Ellen can, uh, can react to that, and you can also man maybe react to how uh, your systems are taking into consideration people with disabilities, and also um, whether there are any specific positions or, or types of uh, job seekers uh, that uh, where the biases uh, can influence uh, the income of hiring, and uh, what are the most uh, common biases. Yeah, and I can only uh, uh, agree to everything that's been said here, um, just prior to to this and um, from my perspective I think that um, it's not actually the technology that's the whole problem it's people and processes and uh, if we look into the uh, the challenges that we have in the fundamentals of recruiting that's the problem education of an awareness of a kind of unconscious bias and discrimination of law that lies for the decision of the hiring that's the problem. So what we need to do is that we need to address those problems. We need to look at the fundamentals of how a recruitment process is being collected and how the data is being collected, how the manual processes without technology are affecting the outcomes of our decision. That's the problem. So I wanted to, to just follow up on that and yeah. to say that if we want to create a change uh, with technology on top of, of sort of the fundamental process, we need to change the process first. We need to make sure that we include candidates that, has, that comes from different backgrounds, that everyone's invited to the table in the process. Uh, we need to make sure that we assess the abilities, the qualities, the skill sets in an accurate way so that we know that the skill sets are actually being measured in an accurate way. Uh, and we need to be aware of our own unconscious biases throughout the process, and that's where the training comes into picture. I think that unconscious bias training is one of the most important things for people in making hiring decisions. If we're not aware of the people that we are excluding from the process uh, by having our own preconceived opinions of who to choose and the decision that lies uh, from that, then we have a huge problem. I think that we need to start there. Now, looking into, uh, into the, uh, sort of the whole fundamentals of recruiting, there is obviously a lot of, of uh, pitfalls uh, 
uh, in a recruiting process. One of the most common ones are, of course, like age, gender, disabilities, and so on, that are discriminatory acts, uh, but also from the unconscious bias part, where we have confirmation bias. That's one of the most common way that recruiters apply bias into the process, which is you recruit someone that you uh, are very much alike yourself because we trust ourselves and we feel comfortable in that situation. Uh, there's also um, other types of, of unconscious biases, like the halo effect. We tend to look at all the good things in the process and highlight that, that or in the inner persons and in skills. And also um, the horn effect, which is also the same thing, but the opposite, like we only look at the bad things. Um, like if someone has a gap in their resume, for example, that's a bad thing for a recruiter, and we tend to look at that, uh, and we tend to um, 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 prioritize people that has certain brands in their resumes and so on. So if we can look into the fundamentals of the process and be aware of the biases that we have unconsciously in the process, because we can never take them away. They will always be there, and sometimes it's also good. But we need to be aware of them, because if we can be, we can also structure the process and put the data in front of us to make an informed decision. And things that doesn't belong in a recruitment process, such as um, numbers of age, for example, it doesn't belong there. Um, looks doesn't, always, doesn't belong there either. Gender doesn't belong into the process, so we shouldn't be providing the process with that kind of data, because if we do, it would ultimately multiply into the wrong decision, because if we're faced with the information, we will take the information into consideration. Um, so that, that's basically the things that we can see from the recruitment perspective, that's bias and discrimination is all over the place. But what we need to do is that to mitigate the risk of putting that into decision is to make sure it's not in the process from the beginning. Age, num age gender uh, pictures on a resume shouldn't be there because if we have that in front of us, we will naturally take it into consideration. So if we can have the process more objectively, the outcomes will become better. So what you are saying is indeed, I mean, this unconscious bias will, will be there, but we, try, we, we should try to make it a little bit conscious, to be <laughs> conscious of the unconscious, that we are biased, and the training can, can indeed uh, help uh, to, be, to be aware of, uh, of, uh, of our tendencies and how we can actually, how our decisions can be, can be influenced by that. Uh, now let's go uh, to the results of our pool, and I'm really curious, to, to see whether uh, people are more optimistic uh, when it comes to the AI uh, tools and, uh, and diversity. Oh, indeed. So uh, it, it seems like uh, almost uh, half of the people thinks that AI has a potential to, to improve the di diversity in the teams and uh, actually, yeah, and, uh, and uh, we have very, very few, let's say, uh, people who think that there would be uh, much less diversity. So, so indeed, so which leads us uh, to the second uh, part of our discussion. And uh, this is to look at the positive side of AI, we say from the, from the bias and discrimination point of view, and indeed to, to have a look whether AI can be used to promote diversity and inclusion at the workplace. And uh, let's start uh, this time with, uh, with Maureen. So, um, how can the use of AI strengthen the provision of a reasonable accommodation that you have already mentioned before for, for persons with disabilities? Because indeed we have this employment equality directive uh, for some time, but uh, not all employers are aware of that. So can AI help in this uh, regard? I'm not sure that it can help with making employers more aware of it. I wish it could. <laughs> uh, maybe some clever person can think of a way to do that. But certainly AI could be a powerful tool in providing reasonable accommodation uh, because of its ability to personalize a task and personalize support. In fact, Jared Quinn, a former UN Special Rapporteur on Disability, said AI could revolutionize the provision of reasonable accommodation and make it more effective globally. He also highlighted that AI could widen the digital divide to the extent that it cannot be bridged. So to give some examples of how AI can help, 
with reasonable accommodation. If you take the example of a journalist who has restricted hand function, but voice-to-text technology makes it possible to overcome that and for him to have a job or her to have a job and produce um, materials to the best of his ability and to the equal of anybody else. Um, similarly, reasonable, reasonable accommodation for a person with dyslexia, other learning disabilities or intellectual disability can help by automating some administrative processes, filling forms, generating text or other content, again, speech to text or text to speech, and that makes a bigger range of jobs possible for, for people with those disabilities. And as in the CHEF project, which was um, a very long time ago, AI can provide on-task prompts that can be useful to people with intellectual disability, brain injury, or people who have suffered a stroke or other cognitive impairments. Those texts could be text, speech, symbols, spoken word, video clips, delivered in ways that suit the person's preferences. And the AI can learn in its interaction with the person, which is where it gets its particular power from. And I found it interesting that DeepMind scientists at Google introduced what they called OPRO, optimization by prompting, as a method of improving large language models. And they found that the prompt, take a deep breath and work on this problem step by step, was the most effective prompt to work with Google's Palm 2 language model. So if AI can prompt other AIs to do better, they could certainly learn to prompt human beings. And the difference that it made was between 80.2% accuracy and 34% accuracy without the AI prompt. So there's huge power to be exploited there and a lot of work to be done. Virtual or augment, augmented reality workplace training programs are another example of where AI can um, make it easier, can be a reasonable accommodation. But it needs to be designed with accessibility for people with disabilities. An example of that are avatars who can translate speech to sign language, and that can be incorporated into workplace training, which would help some people with deafness. So the system of reasonable accommodation requires employers to consider the needs of employees and job applicants on a case-by-case -case basis. The decisions require balancing competing interests, that is, the accommodation of the person's needs with the costs to the business. Those are nuanced decisions. Um, and as I said before, they may mean that AI is not appropriate and that the employer has to manually make the decisions or process the person with disabilities to fulfill their obligation. So it's hard to overestimate what needs to be done, but the potential is huge. People who do not have disabilities underestimate how complex it is to make AI accessible and fair to people with disabilities. So at the moment, there's still a mismatch between the hopes and expectations and the harsh reality that people with disabilities have been left behind so far in the AI revolution. Indeed, but uh, it sounds that the message is still positive. So there is uh, indeed uh, a potential, Huge potential. Uh, which, uh, which, which we just uh, need, to, need to leverage. Um, and now um, back, to, back to Virginia. Uh, so um, we are really curious about uh, these uh, ways of mitigating the bias. And uh, could you tell us what are the best practices that employers uh, can maybe implement to, to mitigate bias from, from the recruitment or the performance management process? And in what way can AI be leveraged to actually promote diversity beyond mitigating the bias? So, uh, thank you very much for the examples and the, the, the positive examples of how AI can be used. AI is, is a tool, 
And like any other tool, we need to think about is a tool for what and is a tool for who. I'm left-handed, I cannot use the scissors like uh, right-handed people can use. Uh, so even simple tools like that come with an affordance. AI is even more affording some uh, functionalities for some of us, but it might at, at the same time, time be retracting the functionalities for others. And uh, when we talk about responsible development and use of AI, the first question that needs to be addressed is the question of, and you, you said that in, in more or less the same words, should AI be used here? And this question starts, uh, and answering this question starts by understanding who is going to answer this question. Is that the developers? Is that the employers? Is that the government, the policy makers? Do we need an uh, inclu uh, inclusive approach? Yes. Who is going to be included? So all these questions and all these uh, issues determine how AI tools, AI uh, functionality is going to be developed. And going back to your issue of mitigation of bias, uh, when uh, you talked about uh, not taking into account age, uh, gender, uh, um, and all other types of characteristics, I fully agree that those don't belong in the decision process. The problem with AI is that AI is extremely easy to understand I re-identify, even if they are not appearing in the, in the CVs or in the decision process, AI is very good at understanding from all other types of uh, pieces of data, whether this is a female or a male, whether it is an older or a younger person. So it, it comes back into the AI um, um, lead, uh, AI led decision. So even if the person is not aware of those things, AI can reconstruct this type of uh, uh, characteristics, which in a sense, it's also important to take into consideration because then AI will be able to tell us, look, you think that you are taking a objective and unbiased uh, decision, but we can see from all the process and all the decisions that actually the bias are still there. We see that, for instance, in, uh, in health uh, healthcare uh, decisions in which here in Europe we take away uh, typically the uh, characteristics of uh, race and et ethnic background, and then it makes it extremely difficult to understand whether there was a bias there against people of different ethnic backgrounds. So we need to be aware that by removing those uh, sensitive attributes that we might uh, be... Uh, in a sense, making it more difficult to mitigate the bias because we cannot really then reconstruct those bias. Okay, so indeed, uh, um, when it comes to the to the mitigation of the of the biases, I mean, we need to we need to imply the, the technological side. I understand, so, and uh, and it it comes now now, uh, Elin, to you because you you mentioned that you are working. Um, uh, within the technology to really take into consideration only the parameters which are relevant for the job, so really the skills and take and not really considering other things like like gender or, or age or uh, numbers of years of experience even. Um, in practice, what are the, the, the key elements uh, or key requirements to the use of AI that allow to take a bias out of the recruitment process? And, and at the company level, who would be the, the key actors that should be involved in the design and, and implementation of the bias-free AI technology? Yeah, so from our perspective and my sort of overall philosophy when using automation or different kind of tools for the recruitment process is to start with the structure. Like what kind of data is going to be used in this process? How do we collect the data? What's relevant for the decision? What kind of skills are we going to measure? Uh, what, what's important for, for the next step of the process? And as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, technology is not really the problem there, um, process is. So if we can start with the process, start with the structure of the process and how, collect and how data is going to be collected and make sure that the data is also being collected um, inclusively for all applicants in the exact same way, in the exact same type. Um, for example, we're using uh, an uh, on-screen avatar for having conversations with candidates in both 
um, in both audio and written and text, uh, just to make sure that we can include every single candidate that applies for a job. So um, we're not using resumes and so on in this process because we know that resumes are unstructured data. And unstructured data naturally is hard to, to make patterns in. So we want structured data so that we can make patterns in that data and that we can collect the data that's important for the decision making. So th that's just one of the examples. And I think that when we are implementing this sort of technique in new uh, in, in companies, uh, it's an orchestration between different layers in the organization. It might be everything from top management to uh, uh, the practitioners. But everyone needs to be aligned on how the data is going to be collected and how the data is going to be analyzed. Uh, and then there's also the part of compliance from a data security perspective that we also always need to take in consideration. Um, how is the data being uh, um, um, monitored and how, uh, how are the analysis of the data? So it's an orchestration in a, in a company to be able to make sure that we cover all parts of the decision making for, for the hiring managers when implementing this sort of technology. Uh, I have a question because you mentioned these uh, avatars that you've been using instead of robots. I understand this is the next step already. Um, uh, what is the perception of people of that? I mean, they, are they already used to it? I mean, do you feel that it's kind of a, already a normal or is this, are they still surprised to see an avatar instead of a human person? I want to turn the question because um, most candidate doesn't meet a person. They are being rejected before that situation. So what we offer is an opportunity to showcase your skills early stage in the process. So uh, the, can the candidates that are now being probably selected for the next step of the pro process wouldn't have been selected otherwise because of people's own opinions or assumptions or the, um, the way that they conducted their, their processes um, earlier. So that's one key benefit, that we can include more candidates early stage in the process and make sure that everyone has a voice or has a say or has um, a, a way of producing their own data in the process. Uh, but then going into the process, if you're expecting a person <laughs> sitting on, uh, on the other side, you will be disappointed because um, humans are humans and we expect them to act as humans. But if, you, if that's not how it's presented, then you will not be disappointed. So I think it's, we can see a, a large volume of applicants that has a, a positive, positive experience uh, from, our, uh, from our process, but it's mainly also because it's put as early as possible into the process, not as um, uh, a complement for uh, a human-to-human -human interaction much earlier. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so I think we are now um, going towards the, the section about indeed the policy and legislation. We were expecting another uh, participant, uh, Mr. Brando Benifei from and the European Biden. Parliament. It's my pleasure to introduce our last uh, uh, last uh, key speaker. Uh, indeed, uh, Brando Benifei is a member of European Parliament. He is the rapporteur of the um, uh, Artificial Intelligence Act, and he was also a shadow rapporteur of the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in Digital Age. And in 2016, yep. he was included by Forbes in 30 under 30 to watch list. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Benifei, we had a, a warm-up questions for all the candidates at the very beginning of the session. And I have one question for you. You can answer very briefly. Um, as AI continues to expand into various domains, are you concerned that AI might replace politicians anytime soon? Um, I do not think so, because um, the, what um, an AI can do is maybe tell us what can be the best uh, um, um, policy instrument uh, or combination of policies that can deliver a certain result. But the AI cannot decide what are the values that we want to pursue. It could have learned from the data it has been trained with, but this data will come from a set of human values. So it could be totally biased in a way that we do not uh, like. It could have its own set of values, which might not be 
coordinated with the way people have voted. And I, I think that the lack of understanding of certain human uh, causality elements that uh, AI is still not able to, to understand will make it impossible to sub substitute politicians at the moment who have the role to interpret um, a, a mandate based on a set of values and a mandate from, from uh, uh, voters. Um, I, I think that maybe in the future AI can substitute uh, everything, um, but it, we are, I, have, I cannot say this will not happen, but at the moment I think we are very, very far from that. I think we are all relieved. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the answer that, uh, that the important decisions <laughs> will sure. stay with I'm humans. Not sure. <laughs> I'm, not sure. I'm not sure that everyone is relieved that, that politicians <laughs> cannot be replaced by AI. But I think <laughs> that at the moment we are not there. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go to a more serious part of our discussion now. And indeed we have already discussed uh, two questions. So I'll give you actually both of them more or less at the same time. So as a shadow rapporteur of the European Parliament's report on artificial intelligence, uh, what biases were identified by the report in relation to AI at the workplace? And did the report also identify any ways to minimize and mitigate biases and discrimination stemming from AI at the workplace? Can AI be instrumental in that? Yes, for sure. Um, there is this risk of uh, biases in the workplace. That's why we have put the use of AI in the uh, AI regulation in the high risk categorization. So for us, the use of AI in workplace is uh, pending uh, a few exceptions, uh, a uh, high risk use case. So this needs to be dealt with with uh, a um, procedure of uh, um, conformity assessment from the developer of AI that is uh, quite significant because it needs to look exactly on how to mitigate discrimination risks. I give you a very easy example, very obvious. There are today systems to select curriculum that are uh, biased on the idea that women and, we and people that are not white are not suitable for certain kind of jobs uh, of uh, more importance and more responsibility and maybe more salary. Um, this is already the reality. But also, you could look at generative AI that is also used uh, in workplaces that sometimes uh, is trained in a way, so in some cases, that if you ask them, for example, who is uh, a, uh, show me a, a industry uh, CEO? It's always a man. Or if you ask them, show me a family, it's always an heterosexual family. This is... Uh, obvious examples of this kind of biases that have been uh, learned by, by the systems. And we have um, uh, uh, put in place uh, rules so that we can um, um, reduce the risk of biases. It's impossible to be sure that we eliminate them completely, but we work to reduce them as much as possible through the conformity assessment. And also we want to prohibit some uh, practices also in the workplaces that we think could be discriminatory and could be also a matter of pressure on workers. On this last point, I must say we are still negotiating with the governments, but I want to mention it. We, the parliament has proposed to ban emotion recognition in workplaces because we think this is a, a way to put a, any, a, a pressure on workers that will feel uh, under control over uh, so to do uh, over in a kind of a monitoring that is not for us useful for um, um, a healthy workplace. Um, and also um, uh, we think that it's very important that uh, um, the in involvement of social partners is guaranteed so that uh, when AI is introduced in a workplace, the representatives of workers uh, have the, the possibility to discuss this with the, with the, with the uh, 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 business that is, is, is using it. Today, unfortunately, instead, we still have situations, I mean, not everywhere, but there are cases of uh, AI being used in the lack of, uh, of knowledge of the uh, workers themselves. So we want to avoid these situations that we think are not compatible with our European values. 
Okay, thank you very much. You, you already touched on, on, on certain requirements of the Artificial Intelligence Act when it comes to the emotional recognition, etc. And when we still have you on the, uh, on the screen, uh, we see that you work in different difficult conditions. So we will already give you the last question so that um, then we can maybe relieve you. Um, so uh, indeed, now we, we came to the, to the discussion about the the need for any specific um, policy or legislation maybe beyond the existing and upcoming uh, framework. And I would like to hear from your perspective what you think that will be the role of the AI Act when it comes to addressing uh, workplace discrimination and, uh, and biases and maybe some other initiatives in the digital area. And whether you see um, indeed a need for any additional EU level uh, legislation or policy and what it should focus on. Yeah, I, I mentioned already some things that we will do with the AI Act. I can say that we already proposed, that this was in the AIDA report, the Artificial Intelligence in Digital Age Special Committee final report, of which I was one of the rapporteurs. I was the shadow rapporteur for my political group, the Socialists and Democrats. We put it clearly and we got a, I mean, mildly positive reaction from the Commission, so we are hopeful. Uh, uh, that we need a specific directive on AI in the workplace to develop more uh, these aspects that the AI Act can tackle only to some extent because of its uh, internal market nature of, uh, of law. So we will uh, pursue this idea. And also, I want to say that on algori uh, algorithm and work, we also have the Platform Workers Directive that is being negotiated that is very important on uh, rights in front of the algorithm by workers. And it necessarily interwines also with some things that we are doing uh, with the AI Act. And in fact, we are trying to coordinate uh, the work on the digital side. So the European Union, I think, has been already active on uh, giving uh, uh, protections and rights to workers in a, in a new world. Uh, the world of the digital economy in its uh, new stage that has been reached. Um, but there is still a lot to do, and we need to uh, pursue, I think, our competitive model, uh, knowing that if we want social protection, we also need to be competitive with uh, investments and with uh, a, a strong technological base. So I also want to send a message here on the fact that we need more unity of our union. We need uh, a more uh, coordinated union on the efforts on the digital economy if we want to be competitive, but also at the same time maintain our values in a changing world. It's not easy if we are fragmented. We need more unity of action, not just rules, but also in terms of industrial policy, in terms of uh, 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 changing uh, world of the learning and training of our workforce, and a lot of dimensions, the research, obviously, the scientific work. There is a lot where you, Europe can do more together and in this way do better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for, for all your answers. And uh, we are very, very happy that you could still join us. Uh, we understand that you are very busy. The uh, Artificial Intelligence Act is being negotiated in a very kind of quick pace. So thanks a lot and, and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. So and uh, now indeed we continue with our uh, discussion on the on the on the legislation and, and policies etc. And I would now start with uh, Eline this time. So um, I would like to hear what is the demand by organisations when it comes to the bias-free recruitment services, and do you think that the labour market can self-correct, or do we indeed need a specific legislation or policy to to mitigate biases and discrimination at the workplace? Yeah, just, I mean, I've been working in this industry for almost 20 years now, and I have seen little to no change in the fundamentals of the process. Um, so from my perspective, it takes a long time to educate people. Uh, I think that we need policies, frameworks, and legislation in, in place to make sure that we um, 
make the right decision in our hiring decision every time and that people are being included into the recruitment process and are being selected for obvious reasons. Uh, I think that's a huge problem uh, because I'm, uh, because the, the policies are not there. We have the Discri Discriminatory Act, of course, and the, the legislation around that. But I think that still we have uh, a lot of awareness work to do in what makes a good hiring decision. Uh, use science, behavioral science, and all the sort of uh, um, best practices uh, and data points to, to make better hiring decisions. But we need policies, legislation, in order to have them in place, to force people to do right. And we can see that from uh, over 15 years when we started working with this in this very uh, provocative uh, recruitment agency in Sweden, that uh, when we forced uh, rules upon people uh, on how to conduct the process, they naturally turned into seeing the outcome of the process in a different way, and the outcome was different. We could see higher diversity, we could see higher representation of, uh, of minorities, we could see higher representation of all uh, categories. So if we force some good things with policies, that could actually make a huge difference. And also in turning uh, technology as a top layer on, the, on that sort of policy. Indeed, so even from the business perspective, the, the, the policy and legislation is important to, to really clear the set context and, and clear rules. And uh, Virginia, from, from your perspective, I mean, a lot has been done around um, um, audit bias, uh, bias audits uh, for in the United States, uh, for mm -hmm. example. Um, so what do you think that should be the rules um, that apply to the, um, to the use of AI and uh, so that we can uh, mitigate these biases that we have discussed? Could these audits, for example, could be one of the options? And uh, do you see yourself any need for any specific legislation beyond what, what we have already discussed? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, we have talked a lot about the use of AI in recruitment. However, AI has been used in many other uh, parts of our uh, job lives and we need to take those into account. You gave some positive examples of how AI could be used for integration of uh, people with disability and so on. But one thing we have not talked yet about is the role of people in the AI industry. And what we are seeing there is that people are being used to serve the AI systems that are being used by others. So people are there to do the, the bridge between the robots where the robots cannot really pick, uh, pick stuff. Uh, you, uh, at the pace of the robot, and we see that, for insta instance, in the warehouses, the Amazon warehouse is one of the examples that comes again and again. So people are there to serve the robot and to work at the pace of the robot. But at the same time, and maybe even worse, people are being used to do the jobs and the, the cleaning up of the AI-generated uh, content and the people-generated content. And we are exposing a huge amount of people to exactly those things that we don't want no one else to see, the pornography, the fake news, the, uh, the, discrimi the discriminatory news and so on, it is being done by people and these people are really, uh, we do need some legislation and we do need some best practices to ensure that we are not creating a, 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 la a new layer of employment which is in a sense below the, what we are providing to the AI systems and this is something which is as much important in the whole industry as the effects that AI might or not have in, for instance, recruitment. You're issues. referring, for example, to the content moderation. The content no, moderation, that, uh, which the actually ghost workers, from the the all those population. people. Yeah. And it is an increasing task force. Mm -hmm. They are enor enormous numbers. We try to ignore them because we put them somewhere else in the world. We don't put them in our own countries. We put them far away. So we try to ignore them, but we cannot ignore them anymore. It, and, uh, I think that we need to have legislation, we need to have best practice, we need to have rules to say that great to develop these AI systems, but it cannot be at the expense of a new labor class which goes there even below the AI system. Mm -hmm. Okay, indeed. Uh, um, Marine, Ma Maureen, uh, now we will, we will conclude this uh, session in detail with, uh, with you and I would like to hear from your perspective 
Um, when it comes to the recent uh, legislative policy initiatives, we discussed uh, the, the Artificial Intelligence Act, uh, the Platform Work Directive, but there are other like digital decade, digital rights and principles, etc. Um, what do you think that this is role of this legislation in addressing biases towards uh, persons uh, with disabilities at the workplace and whether you personally see a need for any new legislation or, or policies uh, to, to tackle these issues? Okay, well, we talked a little bit about the EU Employment Directive, which is the most directly relevant piece to, to today's discussion. And we've seen the shortcomings in that, that it was there to, in order to create a fair and equal workplace. Um, and that's not only in getting into employment, it was progress through it, access to training, access to all the opportunities. And it hasn't worked as we hoped. Um, and that's in spite of the fact it's been around for 20 years. So There's been enough time for people to adapt and get used to it. So, so what do we need to do? And I think we need to, first of all, that, that that act came out of the disability movement and, and a lot of the equality initiatives that we've seen came out of a civil rights campaign in which the disabil disability movement achieved more than a million signatories, which is a rule which forces the EU to introduce the directive. And that has empowered some of, of what came after. So we've had the um, Equal Employment Directive We've had more recently the European Accessibility Act, which drives access to certain types of goods and services and is a not insignificant achievement. It means that the manufacturers and developers of smartphones, ATMs, terminals, any interface between humans and uh, a service system must be accessible. The Web Accessibility Act which is about government public websites and uh, mobile apps also have to be accessible to disabled people and must have a feedback loop so that uh, disabled people can say, this is not working and why. Um, but they still don't have the teeth, they're not enforced to the extent that they need to. And if I compare that with my experience in the non-digital world, um, in Northern Ireland, where sectarian discrimination um, has been the source of, of conflict for a number of years, with the Fair Employment Act that was introduced there, the penalties against employers who do not follow it and who do discriminate are very high. There is no cap on the penalty that can be imposed on an employer if they can be found to have discriminated against someone on the grounds of religion, political opinion, or background, um, so or, uh, religious background. So uh, I think we need to look at how things are implemented and how they are enforced. So the EU has set frameworks and standards which are across the EU. For most of those equality pieces of legislation, the enforcement is at the national level and sometimes that is at the local level and it's very appropriate that it should be at the national and the local level. But we must see how that's working and see what needs to be strengthened. We still fall short of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which gives disabled people much more comprehensive equality and civil rights across the, the, um, all areas of life. Okay, thank you. So I understand there is still a scope for, for more things uh, to be done, indeed, uh, at, at different levels. And I would like now to turn to, to, to the audience. Uh, if you can sw turn, off, uh, turn the lights a little bit uh, stronger and see whether there are any questions from the public. I hope that you are still awake and that uh, you have still some curiosity and, uh, and some questions on mind. Yes, there is one. Uh, Oh. Hi, um, my name is Paola. I work for the delegation of Canary Islands. Uh, thank you so much for the presentations. I really enjoy them. And I was just wondering, like here, like the majority are women, <laughs> and <laughs> the workers like on private tech companies, like they usually they are like men. 
So I would like to know if you could like elaborate a bit more on how can we like really sensitize um, workers on private companies and tech companies especially on this issue and engage them more than sensitize. Thank you. Would like to take uh, the question? Maybe. Oh, I can have a go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, indeed, it's a very well known problem in the STEM industry, so industries in uh, science, technology, and mathematics, that the the divide, the, the gender divide, is very big. Uh, I don't really, know, I don't really have a solution to it. I think that the awareness campaigns are uh, are increase, uh, increasing, but still, there is. Uh, I, I think it needs to start not only at the hiring moment and the decision, which are important to take into account but probably it's a kind of process that has to start much earlier and a lot of people in, uh, in STEM education have talked about that. We need to really start much earlier in the process and not only in high schools but even in uh, basic education and primary schools to really try to uh, dim diminish this uh, gender divide across STEM and non-STEM uh, education and uh, participation because if without that we keep having the same problem at the level of the STEM industries. Indeed. Unless you want to comment, uh, we still have some questions. I saw this. Uh, if you can have a microphone, please. Thank you. My name is Lara from the European Commission. I would have a question about the avatar, because it seems that it could help with some of the things that we hear about um, the shortcomings, let's say, of quotas. So the fact that sometimes some people don't feel legitimized when they uh, do get a job in a context of quota. Uh, so I was just wondering if you have followed some of the people that have been hired uh, with, um, with the avatar or you know, with your technique over the, these five years, and if you notice that this is less of a problem. Thank you. Um, we can see from results that the outcomes uh, are more diverse, uh, but it's still hard to follow up. Uh, we, want, we want to do that. We don't have the data in a larger scale yet. We're still quite new on the market, I would say, and a young, a young company. Uh, but together with clients, that is something that we're exploring, uh, exploring further on and something that's super important to us to understand more about the outcome and also to, to use that data and feedback in, back into the system. Um, before we give another possibility to the audience here in the room, uh, we have a, actually plenty of questions from Slido, so I would take actually the one that is the most popular. And uh, let's see who would like to reply to that. Um, the question is, can should AI be used for positive discrimination? And I think it's a question that comes back because indeed AI is supposed to be objective, but maybe we want to also use it the other way around. Do you have any views on that? Well, first of all, positive discrimination is legal in terms of getting people with disabilities into the workforce. So yes, certainly AI should be used for positive discrimination. I can only agree. Yeah, I think so. And that there, there are not only for the discrimination, the, the positive discrimination at hiring uh, moment, but also to support yes. those uh, that have been uh, in the workforce to help them uh, do their tasks in a, in a way that fits with their own uh, possibilities and uh, capabilities. And yeah, you have given some of those examples as well. And, and career progression. Yeah. Yeah. To, to get into higher valued jobs, higher paid jobs, yeah. greater yeah. decision making exactly. um, possibilities. Yeah. Uh, there is one question also in the audience, so please. <coughs> Hi, my name is uh, Therese Moreau. I'm a journalist from Denmark. Um, how do you distinguish between positive and negative discrimination? The reason that I ask is because we actually had a um, well, a system in, in Danish job centers um, that was used by the job center to evaluate whether or not a, a new job seeker would be a, at risk of being long-term unemployed. And the Danish job centers, they said, well, we need this kind of algorithm to tell us the risk of uh, the person being long-term unemployed. 
so that we can do positive discrimination with regards to calling them in for meetings. What actually turned out was that <laughs> this, um, this model uh, was discriminating on the basis of four variables, including ethnicity. So, uh, well, <laughs> human rights organizations are saying, well, this is not positive discrimination. This is actually negative discrimination based on ethnicity, whilst the state is saying, well, this is positive, positive discrimination. We are trying to help people who have um, difficulties getting a job due to their background due to their ethnicity. So how do you distinguish in practice in cases like these? I think you have to be clear about what you're wanting to achieve in the first place and, um, and make sure that you're taking account of, of as, as many factors or, or different characteristics or bases for discrimination um, because we are all multiple, have multiple identities and multiple factors in who we are. Um, so I think if you are wanting to increase um, the proportion of women in the workforce or the proportion of people with disabilities in the workforce, that's a very targeted um, kind of, of action. Um, but you also have to be careful that you're not at the same time discriminating against somebody in terms of ethnicity. So it's like it's, it's similar with, with disabilities. You can make an adjustment for somebody who has visual impairment, which makes life more difficult for somebody who needs visuals to help to understand the situation. So, and I think you always have to judge by results. So you, you try something, test it, see what the results are, so that you're not having inadvertent uh, negative discrimination. And uh, I think that we also need to take a participatory approach. Often what we see this kind of well-meant uh, uh, policies is that someone, some politician somewhere in an in a, uh, office decides, yeah, we have to take these steps for positive discrimination without really involving the, the communities and the, the, the groups that are potentially or not being positive or negatively discriminated. So I think that uh, it needs to start with a participatory approach, really take uh, those into account, those that you are aiming to, to support uh, into account, take them into the discussion and understand exactly what are their specific needs. And I think it's much more about creating a, a level playing field for everybody than talking about positive or negative discrimination. So include them, don't decide about them. Indeed, and uh, we have uh, an interesting slide of question, which I think uh, could be for Eline, indeed. Um, it says, what is the role of management in preventing biased decision making? And does diversity in management help avoiding biased decisions at the workplace? What is your experience? Yeah, I think the role of management is always to uh, encourage methods in how we are uh, conducting decisions or how we're making decisions, uh, to look at things uh, from multiple directions always. That's the role of management and to make sure that we uh, are also taking all, uh, all things into consideration, of course. And um, possibilities of AI helping, no, what was it's the gone. other one? It's Should gone. <laughs> It disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> what was the Diver one? diversity in management? Diversity. Oh, yeah, it, was, yeah. it can help indeed. Yeah. I, I think it's not only management and diversity in companies, but mainly the the aspect of getting things through is m basically more important than management because if we can have diverse decision making, diversity of thoughts, diversity from people, diversity in all aspects, we are creating better companies. We are creating companies with higher innovation. We're creating companies with better profitability, and that also feedbacks, the feedback loop back into the companies, uh, making us aware of that we can make more um, investments uh, and so on. So I think, yes, diversity is always the way of going forward. Okay, and uh, Virginia, you already spoke about the fairness and whether that it's possible to for the um, systems to be fair and unbiased, etc. So there is probably a question for you. Is it possible to measure the fairness of algorithms in practice? Would this be useful in the pursuit of eliminating biases from algorithmic management? 
Uh, yes, we can measure the fairness of algorithms. The point is that the, f the, uh, the fairness of algorithms is not always uh, completely aligned what with what we understand as fairness. So there is always a process of interpretation of a concept of fairness, which is a very broad and very uh, complex uh, uh, concept. And in order to build it into an algorithm, we need to understand it or to take a decision about what do we mean by fairness? For instance, is it fair to give everybody the equal resources? Or is it fair to give everybody equal opportunities? Uh, and depending on this type of interpretations, at the end of the, the whole process, we get to some kind of mathematical uh, definition of fairness, and those definitions can be measured. But uh, that is only a small part of the whole process. We need also to take into account how these decisions are made, by who, and what is being taken into account as we move from a very abstract concept of fairness into a very concrete equation in the algorithms that we are developing. And that is a much more difficult to, to measure. It's uh, super interesting. I think I'm afraid that we are uh, coming closer to the end of uh, our workshop. It's indeed uh, Friday late afternoon and uh, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude uh, to our distinguished panelists for the expertise and, and valuable insights today. It was really fascinating uh, discussion, at least uh, for me, for sure. We have, uh, ex um, we have explored the complexities of the biases, how they become embedded in the AI systems. We have looked at the positive side of AI, how it can contribute to promoting diversity. Um, and also we have looked uh, uh, at the current uh, and upcoming legislative framework. We took a good note of uh, of your of your suggestions and uh, at this point i would also like to thank to our audience uh, thanks a lot for for staying with us and uh, also to the online participants um, i understand that the, there is uh, still a cocktail afterwards after the closing remarks so you are all uh, welcome to join and otherwise uh, safe travels and i hope we'll be able to continue this discussion at any time in the future have a nice uh, evening thank you, thank you. Thank you.